Okay, today I'm in my workshop and I just finished off a little project. This is my LoRa radio node. So I have a LoRa radio mounted inside this ABS pipe so it's waterproof. So we can mount this on a pole or on the side of a building. So inside this pipe there's a data transceiver, a 915 megahertz LoRa data transceiver by eBite. And it mounts in there like this. And there's four wires on the output, which you can see here on this connector. So the four wires are the RS-45 A and B, and we have ground and VCC. So those four wires come out the bottom, which you can see here. It's a waterproof connector. And the four wires, we have two twisted pair. So we have a red and black for power, and we have a white and black for the RS-45, that's our data. And then we have a shield, a ground shield, a foil, and that's for uh, transient protection. So this video will be more, more of a vlog. Uh, I'm going to show you what I do when I'm not making YouTube videos. So we'll be looking at this project, plus we'll be looking at solenoid. We'll get into that later. It's a little solenoid here. So next we're going to look at an interface, how we're going to interface this to a microcontroller. And so we could run this uh, LoRa radio node. Okay, here's another type of antenna that I can mount in my ABS pipe. And here's my radiator. It's a quarter wave. And my sleeve is a quarter wave, and I have a coax cable coming out of it with a BNC on one end and SMA another, and that connects up to my LoRa uh, transceiver. So it's another antenna. Um, it's called a coaxial antenna, and it works very well. Okay, so now I can mount my LoRa radio node on a pipe or pole with a pipe-to-pipe -pipe clamp, and then run the control cable down the down the pipe, and it could be a very long run because we're using RS-45, which is basically a differential UART. So now these four wires, these two pair, can be hooked up to my interface. This is my interface board. And on this board I have interface for everything I could think of. I have interface for UART, I squared C, SPI, Dallas Semiconductor 1 wire. I have inputs for switch contacts to monitor animal pen doors, Ethernet, Bluetooth. So I can monitor temperature, humidity, soil pH, uh, sunlight intensity, I even have legacy signaling. I got FSK and DTMF, and I'm using these transformer 600 uh, ohm uh, phone lines. And here's my input, my four wires. So here's my VCC and ground and RS-45. So this is where the four wires come in. Then I can interface. I bring everything into these connectors, and everything here will interface, and I can send the data out to LoRa radio. So I have circuit boards made up like this here, and you can see there's no silk screen and there's no solder mask, so it's easy for modification, so I could get X-Acto knife and I could cut runs, and then I could run 30-gauge uh, silver wire to make modifications to get the circuit up and running. And then I make, i got another board here, so I just populate what I need. So I put sockets in, and I put my uh, chips in, everything is through-hole. Uh, I like through-hole because it's easy to, uh, to troubleshoot and it's easy to repair. And I'm using really good quality sockets. These are gold. These are gold machined hole sockets uh, made by Augit. And if you're really paranoid about uh, contact resistance, then I use uh, Stapleton 22. I put that on the contacts, and that makes a reliability of a solder joint. So it's very reliable. So that's what I that's what I do. I make up the board uh, for my project, and then hook it up uh, to the LoRa radio module. Then I have my little uh, LoRa radio module interface. Now for quick testing of the LoRa radio node, I can use a SCAMP3 board, which has a PicMica controller, and I have that hooked up to an RS-45 board. So it's a UART to 45, so this is my 45 output. So I could connect it up to my LoRa radio node, and I could send data through the SCAMP3 board, and I could test out my node very simply. Okay, the next thing we're going to look at is this little solenoid. This is a DC solenoid. It runs on 24 volts. We apply 24 volts to the coil. It'll energize, and then you take away the 24 volts, it'll, it'll spring back to its original uh, position. Now, if you make a, if you make a YouTube video about uh, driving a solenoid with a transistor, and you do not put the freewheeling diode across the coil, you'll hear about it. But they don't tell you what happens after that. Now, if you put a freewheeling diode across this coil, and you give a signal to the transistor to energize it, you'll energize, and then we take that signal away, it's going to stay in this position for a while, for a bit, before it releases. Now normally that's not a problem, but if you're dealing with, say, uh, fuel injection on a car, a fuel injector, or the dwell time on a, on a uh, ignition system, 
that will make a difference. If you're just turning on and off a fan or a light, it doesn't matter. But for timing, if you have a freewheeling diode, it's going to stay. It's going to stay in this on position or this pulled in position, even though you have no drive uh, to the transistor. So we're going to look at a different way of doing it, and I'll show you why I need to do that uh, in this video. Okay, here's a waveform showing the voltage and current applied to the solenoid coil. And we have S, that's our stroke time, in the very bottom. So we give a step voltage into the solenoid coil, that's called U. So we'll step it up to 24 volts. Then it starts drawing current, that's J, so you can see the current comes up until it hits a steady state. So J is a steady state current, and we have a steady voltage across the solenoid. And S is the stroke, so it's, the solenoid is pulled in. Now when we take away the voltage from the, across the coil, that's U, so it drops down to zero, we're going to get a back EMF, and there's a big spike. You can see it goes all the way down. That's a big voltage spike. And then it recovers. So when we take away the voltage, U drops down. Time T2, you see in the bottom, that's the time it takes for the solenoid to be released. That's T2. So remember that time, and then we'll have a look at a waveform that has a freewheeling diode across the solenoid. Okay, here's a waveform of the current and the voltage applied to the solenoid and our stroke time at the very bottom when we have a free wheeling diode across the solenoid coil. So we, we put a step voltage in across the coil, that's U, that's a 24 volts, and you can see the current ramps up again to J, that's, that's our steady state with a voltage U across the solenoid. Now when we drop our voltage off, when we take away the voltage across the coil, it's going to drop down and we're going to get a, a back EMF, the magnetic field is going to collapse. But now with a freewheeling diode, it's going to force all that energy to recirculate through the coil of the solenoid, which you can see here. You see J, now she starts coming down. She comes down, 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 and takes all this time. So if you look at T2, that's how long it takes for the coil to release. So after the voltage is taken away across the coil, the, the, the solenoid is still going to be energized until T2 happens, the time of T2, before she's totally released. Okay, here's the mechanism that the solenoid activates. So when I pull in the solenoid, you can see this part here, it's, it's normally horizontal. And when I pull in the solenoid, she comes down on an angle. And then when it releases, it goes back to its uh, horizontal position. So when I activate the solenoid, it pulls this uh, part down. So this mechanism is part of an apple packing line. So right now we're packing apples at the farm. So we're going to have a visit to the farm and have a look how this mechanism works in the apple packing line. So when I pull this in, I could, I could push this down with my finger until I come to a point where she's going to lock right there. She's locked until I press it in again. So we're going to see how this mechanism works in an apple packing line. Okay, here is a bin of apples that is going to be dropped into the water tank. Now the apples are called ambrosia. They were discovered in 1987 in a small town called Coston, which is in the Okanagan Valley of British Columbia, not too far from where I live. Now, Abrosia apples started out as a chance seedling. It was one in a million. It was actually an accident. One tree gets cross-pollinated with another. An apple grows, falls to the ground, and the seed grows into a tree. So you can see the apples now are starting to float because the bin has been pressed down to the bottom of the tank. So the apples will all float to the top of the, of the tank. And we have a water pump, which is pumping water into the tank. So it's always a couple of inches above of the river section, which you can see here. So it causes a current. So the current is going to take the apples down and it's going to be sent into a rubber disc bed where all the leaves are going to be taken out and there's the water being brought back into the tank. So we have a cull belt. We take out all the apples that have blemishes, have, that are bruised, and these are all going to go into uh, making juice. Okay, the good apples are sent down another conveyor belt to another section called the scrubbing and drying section. And you can see a set of rollers there. So the even number rollers are connected to one motor and the odd number rollers are connected to another motor and they're running at different speeds. So that will scrub the apples and at the same time it will move them forward. And as they're moved forward, they're going underneath a, a set of fans where they're being dried. So the dried apples now will be set into a, a step conveyor belt where they'll be turned 90 degrees and they'll be set into single file. So we have, we have some belts called V-belts and the V-belts are running at different speeds. They're shaped like a V, and they're running at different speeds. 
So it sets the apples into single file. So there'll never be two apples side by side. They'll be single file. And as they go single file, they'll be singled out and they'll be spun. Now we spin the apples because they're going to be sent into a camera for scanning. So they have to be spinning. You can see them spinning there for size and for blemishes. In the black box ahead there is the camera. After they go through the camera, they're going to come out the other side and they're going to be fed into some cups. Now these cups are going to be sent down the, the line to their exit conveyors where they're going to be dropped off according to their size. So you can see them being dropped there. So they're being measured now by this Hall Effect sensor. It knows how far it's going to send the cup to its exit. And the apples drop off at each exit where they're being bagged. And all the speed of the motors are, are connected up to variable frequency drives. So all motors are three phase, and there's our variable, variable frequency drives. And here's the, the solenoid. Now here's that solenoid I was talking about. Now when that activates, that's going to drop the cup, which will drop the apple into the exit conveyor. So as the computer tells uh, which solenoid to activate, it knows uh, which, which cup to drop. So it drops into the exit conveyor. Now there's a pin on each cup, you can see there, it runs along this le ledge and as the solenoid activates, it's going to drop the cup. The, the cup will go vertical until it comes up to the other end, you can see here, where it's going to come back up and it's going to be horizontal. Then the cup continues on down the, down the line. Okay, so now you know how this mechanism works. So when the solenoid is energized, it's going to drop the cup. Now the re release time is important. If the release time is too slow, then the next cup behind will actually pull it down and you'll get two cups uh, dropping off which, will you, which you don't want. So the release time actually determines how fast you could run the cup line which determines how much apples you could pack so that's a pretty important. So there's more than one way to deal with the back EMF on a solenoid than using a freewheeling diode and that's what I'm working on. So I hope this, this vlog was interesting and it's springtime here in Canada and the blueberries are starting to bloom and we'll be, we'll be picking them next so if there's uh, interest in my vlogs I'll probably do a vlog on the blueberry packing line.